Hi guys, welcome back to Roma Vacations Tiny Tour number four. Uh, thank you for joining us. We are in the heart of Rome in Piazza Venezia. Mircha is going to take over and enjoy Piazza Venezia. So welcome back everybody to our sort of bi-weekly uh, tiny tours. So we're now in Piazza Venezia, which actually gets his name from a different city, right? We're in Rome, but it gets his name from the lovely red building right behind me. This used to be the residence of Cardinals back in the day. I don't know if you can tell, but it's a pretty big building. Right inside of it, you do have a tiny church called San Marco. It's an actual very old church, but it's a cardinal church, meaning that the leader priest inside is one of the Vatican cardinals, one of the men that could eventually, if he's lucky and gets voted, end up as Pope. The building itself starts its history in the early 1500s. It's a fairly turmoil period in, um, in Italian history. You have to understand that the modern um, country of Italy at that point, 500 years ago, was actually a confederacy of loose cities, each one having their own interests and only being united if they're kind of threatened from outside. Otherwise, they all try to see their own piece of the cake. The issue here is that in Italy, in the Renaissance and Baroque period, most of the control was held by the popes due to the fact that they're all Christian. Imagine the fact that the pope can control what city uh, is excommunicated, what city can trade what, um, as far as bronze and other useful items. And also, imagine the popes have the power to control not just the city, but also individuals. They can excommunicate individuals. So imagine it's an age where every single one of the Italian cities is trying to have their turn at the cake in a way. They're trying to have their own men as a pope. So you're going to have cities like Florence, like Venice, like Milan, like Rome. They all try to have a pope. Now, obviously, the more you invest into the church, the more you seem to contribute, the more of a chance your men and people have. So by early 15th century, one of the richest Florentines to live in that period, a man called Pietro Balbo, ends up being cardinal of the tiny church of San Marco. When he comes down to Rome, he's trying to send a message. He builds himself a tiny house inside, but then slowly starts building this medieval um, fortress you guys see behind us. He also brings a 2,500 strong guard of Venetians, and he ends up being the cardinal. Within a few decades, by the mid uh, 1400s, he ends up being Pope Paul II. And at that point, his former residence falls into the ownership of Venice. By the 1560s, he turns into the Venetian embassy. And eventually, by the 1700s, the Austrians will take up part of the north of Italy, and it becomes an embassy of Austria to the Vatican. Eventually, by World War I, Italy recaptures the ground lost, and this becomes a war ministry. Some of you guys might have it familiar in your head from documentaries, because of the balcony that I'm trying to point out at. Uh, that's basically where uh, you have those infamous Mussolini speeches of the beginning of World War II with the brown shirts gathering in the square we we're right now. And they call it Piazza Venezia as a result from the Venetian style palace. Also, keep in mind, it is a bit of an arrogant move. You are in a city that everything looks very, very Roman normally. For those of you that have been here, you know, for those of you that haven't, it's a reason to come. But imagine building a giant Venetian style building in the middle of town. It definitely sends a clear message, right? So that's where you get the name for it. Now, the far more famous uh, monument in the square is the Altare della Patria, the altar of the country. Lovingly labeled by Romans as the false teeth of Rome, the wedding cake, or the typewriter. It is actually built between 1885 and 1935. It is a symbol of Italian unity. Imagine that up until the 1860s, Italy, as I said, was a loose confederacy of cities, each one with their own goal. By the 1860s, the Northern Kingdom, the Kingdom of Piemont, more or less Milan, Turin, and that part of Italy nowadays, manages to unite through peaceful resolutions and through conquest, in some cases, all of Italy as we know it today, with Sicily, with its many islands, and all the ground we love uh, today, the little boot, right? Now, the thing is that they were united on paper. You had the people from the south, not exactly like in the people from the north and vice versa, islanders not liking the people from the mainland and so forth. So as a result, a symbol of unity was needed. And the idea was to make a monument dedicated to Rome. Um, the ancients, the Romans, would have actually deified their own city. There was such a goddess as Roma, right? So therefore, what would bind all these Italians together 
would be the fact that you make a symbol telling them, look, you weren't Florentine, Milanese, uh, from Sicily or so forth. You're now descendants of Rome. We're now all Italian, right? So you make a temple to Rome. And you can see her in the middle uh, with a gold leaf behind right underneath the statue. Now, they start building this in 1885 and it's the work of a Sicilian architect. And I want to draw your attention a bit here. You have a king from the north, from Milan, right? In a country that is very territorially and there's a lot of geographical hate. So the architect was a man called Giuseppe Sacconi and he's from Sicily. So see the political relevance here, king from the north, architect from Sicily. They take it one step further though, with Giuseppe Sacconi choosing many of the statues to be done that you can probably see statues and groups of statues. They were done by Italians from different cities. And in a way, no matter where you come from, the south, the north, the islands, someone from your neck of the woods put their hand here. So it belongs to all of them, not the king in the north, not the architect in the south, is the Altare della Patria, the altar of the country, and that's how they refer to it. However, being built between 1885 um, and 1935, I'm pretty much sure you guys know what happened in the middle of that. It's World War I, right? And Italy did not have the best pick of the lot there. They ended up losing more than 400,000 boys in the north, more than a million wounded. And that's because while most other countries could have the advantage of building a trench, the Italians are fighting in the Alps, with rock faces falling on them and bullets flying everywhere. So as a result, they dedicated the moment to the unknown soldier. The temple itself still remains as a temple to Rome, but right behind the statue of the king, which I'll come back in a moment, you have the tomb of a private, the tomb of a sergeant, and the tomb of an officer forever following their king into eternity as a symbol of respect for the now united country. And while the moment, uh, well, the monument really helped giving an identity to the Italians. The fact that they died all together from all around the country in the north under the same flag is what binded Italy. And that's why it is also a tomb to the unknown soldier. Now, you might notice there's a giant statue right on top of it. In fact, that is the biggest equestrian statue or guy on a horse statue on the continent. His mustache is two meters, or for those of you from the States, six feet wide. Just the mustache. Also want to draw your attention to the very top of it. You have two chariots with a winged lady. The Romans referred to it as Victoria. Most of us know her by a Greek name, Nike. By the way, do you know that the um, symbol of the Nike shoe? It's one of her wings upside down, actually. But the horse uh, chariot is called the Quadriga. Nike is leading the Italians into a prosperous future. That would be the whole message of it. And to wrap up with the flag colors, many of you guys probably heard the um, Funny story from the south, the flag is actually a pizza margherita, right? You end up with pomodoro, basilico, mozzarella. But in reality, guys, you end up with the red and white being the colors of Milan and the green being the colors of the Piemontese army. Stop a moment and think about it. The north conquered the south. This is a fairly controversial movement to keep the same flag, but to today, the Italians love it. Another thing I want to point out in the square, right in the background, you have Via del Corso, one of the main arteries of the city. The Romans are absolutely brilliant. If you see that street behind me, it goes on and on and on for almost three kilometers. Here's what the Romans did with it. Where we are now, you're very close to the Tiber River. So you're very close to where the workshops would have been. Romans would have their heavy industry by the river for several purposes. First of all, fires and the river could put them out. Second of all, water mills and so on. The problem is the river flows down that way, right behind me. So you want everything to flow down. All the resources in the ancient Roman city came from the north, from that side. So imagine having hundreds of carriages having to go through an ancient city with little cobbled streets to get anywhere. That would be an incredible traffic hassle. So what the Romans did is they basically took a rope from the first workshop by the river all the way down behind me to the northern gate to where the resources came and every single building that rope hit, they demolished and they created what they called Via Lata, which is today's Via del Corso, one of the main commercial streets. And the last thing that would be um, definitely worth a check, right behind me, you have Palazzo Novo. If it looks familiar, it's because you have copied after Palazzo Venezia, the one right on the other side. Imagine that when you give a new face to Italy in the late 1800s and you build the giant white monument, the altar of the country, you have a giant monument, then you have the red medieval monument and an empty area on this side. So it didn't look well. So between 1910 to 1935, they demolish all the medieval housing there and they built Palazzo Novo. It was partly built with banking interests, so to today it's owned by Italian banks. One interesting thing about it is that in 2010 they found parts of one of Mussolini's hidden bunkers right underneath of it. it. Remains to be seen when it's open. And with that said, guys, this was it for the tiny tour tonight. 
Hope to see you for another tiny one next time. And I'll leave you with my colleague Angela. Good night. Thank you, Mircha. And thank you everybody for tuning in. We hope you had a great time on this tiny tour. We are gonna be back in two weeks for another Tiny Tour Tuesday. Um, please don't forget, if you have any special requests about what you'd like to see next, where you would like us to go, please leave it in the comments below. So have a great night. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Time kind of facilitating everybody's needs. And Not very good with the cameras, as you guys probably got used to. Uh, look at me using the camera without rolling it. Uh, and keep on trucking.